I'm uh, John Elder Robeson. Um, I'm an autistic adult. Uh, people know me for my uh, writing. I'm the neurodiversity scholar at William and Mary and an advisor to the Neurodiversity Institute at Landmark College. And uh, I'm also an IACC member. I grew up thinking that I was a kind of a, a second-rate person, and, and it gave me a poor self-image all through my life. But I also grew up thinking that, well, if I just, you know, try harder, I'm going to um, get by. And, and there was absolutely no thought of any kind of support for me, so it's either figure out how to live independently or starve. When I look at uh, what changed for me when I learned about my own autism, um, first I'd have to say that I didn't know about autism in people like me before I knew I had this autism. Uh, all I knew of autism prior to my own diagnosis was characters I saw on television that didn't talk. And, um, and I thought, when I first heard, I thought, that's crazy, that's not me. I felt a sense of, of relief that someone had given me um, an explanation for why I was the way I am that wasn't just cruel or nasty. But then I thought, there's no cure for this, because that was the first thing the, the fellow said. He said, well, it's, it's not a disease. It's just how you are, and there's just no cure. Um, and I thought, okay, I've learned why I failed at these things all my life, and now it's good, I know, but there's no cure. I was initially diagnosed with autism when I was uh, 40. And um, I had at that time a, uh, a son who was uh, in second grade. And when he was younger, I didn't know anything about autism. But what I did know is uh, I saw him interact with other little kids and I saw him have these interactional failures, and those failures reminded me of my own childhood, which until that time I had largely forgotten. So I would see uh, my son playing with another kid, and he'd get into a tussle, and and so I started. I would pick him up. I would I, I, we would dress him in these Oshkosh. Um, pants that had lifting handles, and I would grab him, you know, and I could pick him up and, and hold him out, and, and I would say, well, do this and don't do that. I didn't offer autism therapy because I didn't know about autism, but I did know that the stuff he was doing happened to me all those years before, and I would say, do this and not that, and, and I would put him back down. And, and you know, when Cubby was in school, he had friends. And I, I thought that was the most magical thing because the thing I wanted most of all as a little boy was to have friends. And my son had that. And I think that neurodiversity, the idea that there is a range of neurology that is a natural part of the human species. Um, that's a thing that a good many of us seem to be comfortable with and, and really embrace. And neurodiversity is our word. Um, neurodiversity isn't a diagnosis that is bestowed upon us by a doctor. It is our word to recognize that we are different. Our brains are wired different. We don't have to be tested to be told this. You know it. I knew I was different all my life, even with no knowledge of autism as a kid. 
and and neurodiversity is our way to take charge of the conversation to say that neurodiversity is about the mix of exceptionality and disability that we live with but it is mostly a function it's mostly a focus of what we can do and who we are it is a positive thing not an inherently negative thing and and so i think that is really the important idea behind talk of neurodiversity it is absolutely not a denial of disability you can believe in neurodiversity and be very very disabled and and you can also be very very exceptional sure there are autistic people who are profoundly disabled there are women who are profoundly disabled there are, are, are black people jewish people there are members of every population group who are profoundly disabled and some who are exceptional and um and i think that that is the civil rights imperative every single one of those people is entitled to the same respect and human rights in our society it doesn't mean that we should not be doing research to help them we absolutely should uh, people who are affected by autism have many significant medical challenges that we as a society have a duty to do our best to relieve there's no question about that but at the same time there's no question about our basic entitlement to the same human rights and respect as everyone else and and so i think that we autistic people shine a light on some fundamental problems that america has to face as a society um housing is one that is a big one right now i think that all of the autistic people who asked for soft quiet spaces in school for natural light instead of fluorescent light all those things we do those were fights with school districts but who in his right mind would not want to be in that kind of environment autistic or not that the autistic community is at times very fractured people are really heated about what they believe about housing or what they believe about the cause of autism or what should be done and and what i really try and say to people in the heat of that passion is to just take a step back and think about what you really want and and that's what i want to see i want to see autistic people join together with everyone else and form a path to a better future together